Well, I know Elder Elmo almost fell getting on that stool. We'll just sit and watch everybody for a little while. Just, just wait. When, when somebody comes on there, I'll start. Oh, there we go. Hello, Tommy Teehee. Good evening. Good evening. Everybody happy tonight? Yeah. I'm glad you're happy, happy. I can probably fix that. Just give me a minute. <laughs> my job, I tell people, what do you do? And I said, my job is twofold. My job is to comfort the afflicted or afflict the comfortable. You take your pick. Wherever you stand, I can, I can work on you, all right? <laughs> I'm better at afflicting the comfortable, I think. But sometimes I don't even try. It just comes natural. Well, it's a good night to be in the Lord's house. Look forward to our Bible study. We're going to start a new section. I didn't realize when I started writing all this that I had seven or eight pages of notes. We may be here a while, but that's okay. Uh, we will take care of it. Hey, I want to remind you all, uh, Friday night is the Arvis tailgate party at the, is it the Lincoln Westville ball game? And uh, if any of you all, especially you young people, want to go help, uh, it'll be a great thing. We've reached people who are part of our church through that ministry. Uh, this Sunday is Promotion Sunday. If you're moving up to a new class, where do you go after old? I'm the teacher, though. If I was in the class I was supposed to be, I'd be in the old class, okay? Yeah. Huh? Well, I don't know. Do we need to explore this further? Does it really hurt you, <laughs> Well, people who won't admit they're old, they say, no, I'm older. They'll lie about other things, too. Anyway, it's promotion Sunday. How we got off on age, I'll never know. I didn't start it. And then it's also, what? Educator Appreciation Sunday. I'm going to get through this in spite of me or y'all. And this, a week from tonight, our Awana Clubs resume and then the meal resumes. So hopefully everything will get back in shape. Any other announcements, Brother Joel? <clears throat> Excuses, excuses. I'll get you a trailer to go on the back of that little thing. No, I'm kidding. Somebody want to help Brother Joel, let him know afterwards. All right. Uh, I had a good Sunday. I don't know if y'all did, but I enjoyed being here. And I enjoyed preaching. I enjoyed the singing. I wish somebody had got saved, but can't can't control that. My job is to preach the word. And God takes care of the results. But... I'm looking forward to preaching this Sunday. I'm probably going to meddle a little more this Sunday than I did last Sunday. But uh, anyway, I'm going to talk about Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Esau. You talk about a dysfunctional family. People are like, oh, I came from a dysfunctional family. You ain't seen nothing yet, all right? So looking forward to it. Uh, let's look over our prayer list together, please. Uh, how's Josh? I'm starting at the upper lip. Okay, so more surgery. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll leave Josh on our prayer list, and I hope you all 
make time to look over our prayer list when you can and pray for these people. Uh, last we heard, Rulani was doing better. Still. Whitney Wilburn. What about Whitney? She started checking this deal. She has to take My goodness. My goodness. She is going for a rehab, I think. Is what I saw on Facebook. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, okay. Amen. Makes a difference, Brother Gerald. Good. Pray for our missionaries, Brother Norcellus. Uh, talked to Brother Norcellus after he got back to Haiti, and then I talked to Preswa just pretty soon after that. Things are really bad politically in Haiti, and, and typically we didn't worry too much about Brother and Sister Norcellus and their ministry because of where they are. They're 90 some odd miles, but in Haiti, that's a long distance. But uh, the gangs that are running the, the government right now, they're starting to spread out. So pray for their protection and, and that God will still use them. Pray for Christian Martinez and his family. He's still learning the language. And I know y'all pray for Kendra Barnett as often as you think about her and... Uh, our prayer is that the Lord will leave the door open uh, in Romania for them to minister, but I don't know if that'll last that long. Uh, I mentioned Bob and Nadine Spears. They're on the list. We hadn't mentioned them in a while, but pray for them. And pray for Randy and Donna, Donna especially. Tommy Teehee's going to have surgery in November. He's watching tonight. Uh, Cody Shepard. Uh, Eddie Suttle, he was at church Sunday, wasn't he? He wasn't here. Okay, do we need to leave him on there? Okay. All right. Lacey Spears, brother Cody Shepard, keep praying for him. Pray for uh, the Hoosiers, Debbie and Mary. Uh, Mary celebrated 80th birthday this past week. And. Uh, Got to go visit her in the week. I was going to go to her, her drop-in party, but we had a family party, and I couldn't be both places. And since they were celebrating August birthdays, and one of them was mine, I felt like I ought to be there. But I had some good food and some good desserts. Uh, keep praying for Charlie Morton. Charlie is rehabbing well. Still got, still got a ways to go. Pray for Tony Curry, Tony and Jita, Jaquita are both on there. Uh, I haven't got an update this week on Michael Bailey, uh, but he's a young man that had the motorcycle accident. He's still in the hospital. Uh, pray for my aunt and my cousin Shirley and Billy Wilson. Uh, I don't know an update on Virginia Benefield. Rick Neal will go back to Mayo and Phoenix. Uh, they spent most of the hours he was on the table for about six to eight hours, but they were primarily mapping the heart. Where they're going to have now they'll know where to go back to do the ablations. Uh, we mentioned Sarah Page, uh, Charlie Washington. Pray for Charlie. Uh, Eric Dement, Dementi. The la I'll pronounce that right eventually every time. But uh, last I heard, he was doing really well. I haven't heard an update on Reba Tittle, but she's still on our prayer list. Uh, little Brent, we never did get a last name on this, this person. Uh, I don't know anything about Tyler and Taylor Kelsey. Uh, Juan Barnes, any update on Juan? Okay, my goodness. Keep praying for Carolyn Farrell and her family and the Rita Keck family. And the Gail Curtis family, while I have it on my mind, I want to mention to you, our church is going to provide a meal for the Gail Curtis family. That's Tanya Shreve's mother this Friday. If you ladies will talk to Sharon, if you hadn't already volunteered to do something, uh, see Sharon when it's over. 
Uh, Mary Ann Fry was added to the prayer list by Shirley Spear uh, via our uh, uh, Facebook page and got word uh, through a friend that Miss Ann Chandler is running a fever and not feeling well, so put her on the prayer list. Who else? I kind of went over that thing pretty good. I pray for Brother Daryl Chadwell. I just don't need to say why, but just pray for Brother Daryl. I don't, we need to, we need to pray for Missy Trenum. Uh, I, I don't know if she wants to be on the prayer list, but I'm going to mention her tonight. And so put her on the list. I'll take the heat for it if, if I wasn't supposed to, but yeah. Cassie put it on Facebook yesterday, but Cassie Davis has been diagnosed with leukemia. Yeah. It, it is a very treatable form. Scott Davis, uh, Cassie's husband. Uh, I got a call about two and a half weeks ago and they said that he had leukemia, but they researched it in its very treatable form. So, Scott Davis, Cassie Hoosier Davis's husband. Yeah. Who else? Thanks for mentioning Scott, forgot to mention him. And I mentioned uh, Missy Trenum, right? Okay, what was her name again? Faye Nell. Faye Nell. Okay. Thank you. Wow. Okay. A lot of people to pray for, but you know, I'm glad our church has a reputation for being a praying church. I'm not bragging. I'm just I'm just thankful for that. And uh, many of us have felt the power of those prayers. It makes a difference. We know that. Anybody else? Okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, John, for sharing that. We like to hear good reports too. Anyone else? Uh, we, we were praying for Albert because he's, he's trying to get back into pastoral ministry. And uh, he's been in contact with several churches from Texas to he lives in Georgia and even some in this area. But that's his desire. Who else? Well, before we open the word to Romans 12, we're going to pray. And I'm so looking forward to this study. The title of it is What Makes a Healthy Church? What Makes a Healthy Church? Ron, would you pray over these, please, sir? Dear Lord. chapter number 12 please we have covered verses 1 and 2 but I can't not read them again because it ties in with verses 3 through 8 and that's where we're going to be you know James describes the Bible as a mirror we look in a mirror we see ourselves and when we look into the mirror of the word we ought to see ourselves you know, there used to be an old spiritual song. It's, it's uh, not the preacher, not the deacons, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And there were several verses to that. But uh, so often we get the idea 
when the word, either the read word, the spoken word, uh, preached word, whatever it might be, we think, well, that's somebody else. Well, no, it might be about us. And we, we need to take that to heart. And if we don't, and we don't find some joy in that whatsoever, I, I think we, we need to figure out where we are in our relationship to God. Either, number one, we're not saved, or number two, we've drifted so far away from Him that we really can't, can't experience the joy of being in the Word. And a lot of times it just becomes, we do it by rote. We just do it because we have to. But uh, it, it'll speak to us. It, it's alive. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And it knows where we are. So it's a good thing. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I'll talk about that briefly and, and then lead into verse 3. Paul's talking to us as individuals. When we get to, to verse number 3 and on down, uh, he's going to tie this more into the church. And when I say the church, I, I want to make, make a sense of understanding here, all right? When I say the church, I'm talking about like people say, oh, I go to school. Well, there's no universal school. That's an institutional word, all right? Uh, to be specific, I go to uh, Lincoln Middle School or I go to Prairie Grove High School. That's specific, all right? When we talk about church in the institutional general sense, I'm not talking about a universal invisible church somewhere because I really don't believe in that. And almost everybody I read does believe in that, and that's primarily what's taught in seminaries and some Bible colleges. Uh, the only way that I see a universal future church is in, is in the eternal state. When, when all of God's people who are saved and scripturally baptized become a part of his bride, okay? But right now, it's about the local church. This is not my church. It's not even our church. It's the Lord's church. Amen. And we've been blessed to be a part of it. I don't think there ought to be any pride in that. In fact, we're going to talk about humility tonight and pride. But uh, so he starts talking to individuals. And he said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every person, remember primarily that the Bible was written in the male gender person, to every one. That is among you not to think of himself or herself more highly than he ought to think. Well, we could stop and talk a lot there. And we will in a minute. But to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every person the measure of faith. Which is a good way of saying we're all on level ground at the foot of the cross. For as we have many members in one body, this body, our body, but all members have not the same office or the same function, all right? So we, being many, are one body in Christ. Now he's taking the human body, and, and this analogy is in more than one place in Scripture. He's taking the human body and comparing it to the body of Christ, to the church, all right? So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. And then he starts talking about spiritual gifts. And the spiritual gifts are listed in, in, in two other places in the scripture. But we're going we're gonna to go over these. Having then, based on what he's just said, all right, the body of Christ, different members, having then gifts differing according to the grace of that is given to us, and he starts naming these gifts. Not all of them. This is one list. Whether prophecy, 
let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. He that teaches on teaching. He that exhorts or encourages on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. And he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. You ever heard anybody say about a church somewhere? Man, that's a great church. You ever heard anybody say that? I hear that. I hear that. I hear preachers talking about other churches. That's a great church. But I don't think if you said, if you asked someone to define or to describe, well, what is a great church? I don't think anybody knows exactly what it means. So I think sometimes that comes down to a matter of opinion. We, we, it relates to the person, Brother Charlie. So how would you know if a church has become truly great? Maybe they're just on the brink of it, you know. Maybe they're climbing up that ladder and one day they will become great. Some, go ahead. Yeah, right. Well, let's talk about some of these. Some people think it has to do with the size of the church. A large church is a big church. I think that's what a lot of people mean when they say, man, that's a great church. Uh, they think a great church is a big church with thousands of people attending on study, but there's only one problem with that. We, we all know that not every big church is a great church. And many truly great churches aren't very big. Perhaps greatness involves having a famous pastor. I didn't say notorious, I said famous, all right? And it's true that usually most big churches have well-known, famous pastors who write books, or they have a radio ministry, or a TV ministry, and often those pastors speak around the country to huge audiences. But does that mean that their churches are great? It could refer to having large facilities. We've been blessed at Summers Baptist Church, and the Lord has provided the means and the people to accomplish. We have completely changed our facilities in the last, what, 10 years? I mean, it looks different. I have people that, that haven't driven by and they, what happened to that little white church that used to be there? Well, it's not here anymore. Well, did you tear it down? No, time and where tore it down. Uh, you all know, if you were here, we looked into redoing the church, but it was going to be almost <clears throat> impossible to do it. But anyway, uh, uh, the steeple? Well, somebody needs to clean it, but I ain't getting up there and I ain't going to do it. Uh, low, I am with you. If you get a lift, I'll do it, but I'm not going to crawl up on that roof and do it, all right? Uh, it could refer to having large facilities, a huge sanctuary, an enormous parking lot, or that steeple you could see a mile away. Some churches think that greatness refers to the number of programs they have in a given church. Some big churches will have over 300 different events in a given week to a month. Something going on all the time. Well, it could be. could be. That may be impressive to some, but that doesn't mean that church is great. And I'm not, I don't mean to sound negative, all right? Sometimes people associate greatness with a good reputation. Uh, that's not something to scoff at. Since good ministry ought to have a positive influence in, influence in the community. And I think that oftentimes relates to the pastor. And we know that, that there have been many renowned ministers who've fallen into sin and reproach. And people still like to talk about it. I, I noticed y'all remember when Jim Baker had his fall and he started back again after he served some time. I believe he served time. And now one of these investigative shows, they're going to do a big, big special on him. And, and people want to see people like that fall. They do. Uh, haters are going to hate. 
and, and, and that's the way it's viewed. And, you know, if, if a minister falls into sin and reproach, it ought to hurt our hearts. And we ought to pray for them. You know, for the most part, when a minister falls into sin and reproach by the world and by a lot of other people in ministry, they're done. Put a fork in them. They're history. They're done. They're over. I'll, when one of us do that, yeah. we're forgiven if we come back. Right. But I don't think God works that way necessarily. But anyway, we won't get off on that. Some people think great churches are market driven. By that they mean they stay close in touch with what people want and the needs of that community. And you know, a lot of people choose a church and they choose to participate in a church like going through a buffet. If I go through a buffet and they've got shrimp and they've got steak, I'm going to eat all the shrimp and steak I can eat. I don't need anything else. I probably will because there's desserts at the end, okay? But uh, I can put away a lot of shrimp and steak, all right? I go back and have that guy cut me a little old bitty, cut me a bigger piece. Oh, I just get this and I'll come back. But fourth time he gets me a big piece, well, I'm almost done by then. But people go through a buffet and they pick and choose what they want. And they pick and choose what they like. But church is not that way. That's, that's what we call market driven, you know. We, we cater to the needs and wants of people. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I didn't like to go to church. Uh, I always got in trouble at church because I couldn't sit still. I didn't know what ADHD was or whatever they call it, ADD or dumb something. I don't know what, what it was when I was growing up, but somehow, even without trying, I got in trouble at church. When the old white building was there, I got a lot of whippings out behind that church. But I wasn't the only one. I remember one night, Brother Jack Anglin stopped preaching. I don't know where his wife was, but his three little boys were sitting on the front cutting up. He quit preaching. He called on the song leader to lead the song. He took them out back. He applied the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge and got to the bottom of the problem. And then he brought them back in, and they sat still the rest of the night. Evidently, he, he knew how to do it. But anyway... Uh, yeah, we do need no more than that. So what? A lot of people, a lot of people like choose like who goes to the church. Oh yeah. It's yeah. More like uh, especially I think like maybe like social social yeah. social yeah. Good point. It's just a social thing. Right. Right. Uh, I I knew I knew a man who became a lawyer, and he passed the bar exam. He tried to set up a practice in a smaller town. And he had always been part of smaller country churches. He joined the biggest church in town. And I asked him later, I said, why'd you do that? He said, that's what they told us to do in law school. When you go to a town, you establish practice, you join the biggest church in town. Well, I guess biggest means greatness in, in that sense. So, so... Rather than what makes a great church, I want to talk about what makes a healthy church. Because I think if a church is healthy, it doesn't make any difference what size they are, how many programs they have to offer. Uh, right. So, and, and I know churches that might be healthy or be great in the eyes of the world, but they're not healthy at all. And... There are churches that are healthy churches that the world wouldn't consider great. So, based on Romans 12, 3 through 8, there are three essential qualities to a healthy church. Y'all ready? These three qualities involve the way we look at ourselves. I want to say that again. I'll say that every time. It's not looking at the church. It's looking at ourselves. There's an old saying that says, how does it go? What kind of church would my church be if every member were just like me? What kind of church would my church be if every member were just like me? You let that sink in for a minute, all right? So it has to do with the way we look at ourselves 
and our own personal involvement. And it begins with honest evaluation. Honest evaluation. Look again at verse 3. Paul says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every person that is among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he ought to think. Uh, in this verse, Paul uses a word from the literal language, and he says to not think, and, and the word literally would, would correlate to a phrase that we use a lot. Anybody ever said, don't overthink it? You ever heard anybody say that? People say, Becky says that to me all the time. Evidently, she thinks I'm a great thinker. I'm a better worrier than I am thinker, but I do have a tendency to really delve into something way too much, too often. But to superthink or overthink, all right? So don't overthink. That's what literally means. Don't overthink about yourself. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather think of yourself with sober reality. Sober thinking. The idea is that Christians ought to have a realistic view and appreciation of themselves. I've told this illustration in revival sermons through the years, and it, it's about what we're capable of. And there's a story. There was a guy drowning out there, and uh, and this uh, this man he was he was a great swimmer. And, I mean, he's kicking off his shoes, and he. And he had about $10,000 in his wallet. And he wasn't going to jump in the water in that lake with that much money in his wallet. And he said, I need somebody to hold my wallet. And he said, I got $10,000 in here. I want somebody I can trust. And this one guy looked at him. He said, sir, I am a man of integrity. There is no way I would ever take one penny of your money. And the other old boy sitting there kind of looking at him, smiling. And he said, I'll tell you the truth, I'd like to take it. I need it. But by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I won't take your money. Who do you think he left his money with? Yeah. See, see, and, 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 and that's, what, that's what... Humility is not thinking too lowly of yourself or too highly of yourself. Chuck Swindoll said it's not thinking of yourself at all, but we do think of ourselves because we're human. So humility would relate to knowing who we are in Christ. Knowing who we are in Christ. Knowing ourselves. And that will come into play when we start talking about spiritual gifts. All right? So pride comes from super thinking or overthinking about ourselves. And, you know, that comes to blowing your own horn too often, bragging about your accomplishments one too many times, or dwelling on your own supposed greatness. And I've watched this in preachers. You know, uh, I got a few years under my belt now, and I hope the Lord lets me preach and pastor somewhere till the day I die. Uh, it wouldn't bother me if I died in the pulpit. I don't particularly want it to be this Sunday, but that's, you know... But uh, Brother Gerald Mitchell used to preach a sermon, and it was two preachers, and it was about preachers. And he talked about when preachers start moving, and, and I don't think this is just true of preachers. It may be true of deacons and everyone else. But as we, as we move into that old age, I didn't say older age, okay? As we move into that older age, if it makes you all feel more comfortable and you're just lying to yourself. Uh, Leave me alone, DJ. <laughs> we have a tendency to live our lives looking in the past. So I, 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 know, I know a lot of preachers, they, if you look around in their office, you know, they may have a picture on the wall of the Sunday they packed the church out and broke the attendance record. And, and, and they glory in that because they're looking back. That was something that happened, you know, 20 years ago. And, you know, their education tucked away and the evidence of it is hanging on the wall. And, you know, I don't know why we do that. I've got a diploma from high school, a diploma from college, and I never look at them. 
I've never had anybody want to see it. I applied for a job and they would say, hey, bring your diploma. Bring your degree. We want to see your degree. You know, they ask, what is your level of education? I put college graduate. They've never said, I want to see that. I want you to prove it. Now they've met me. They might say, I want you to prove that if you will. All right. What they don't know is it took me five and a half years to get a four year degree. Okay. But anyway, some people struggle in this area of honest evaluation and, and a realistic look inside themselves at who they are. And, and this is going to lead in, I already said, to spiritual gifts. So let me say this. I, I know I'm not a very patient person. Age is taking care of it a little bit, but not as much as it should be. And if you've ever read with me, you know what I'm talking about. But I, I grow weary of hearing people say, well, there's nothing I can do in the church. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. There's always something someone can do in this church, in any church. What you have to do is find out what your spiritual gift is or gifts are. But I'm telling you, based on the Word of God, the day you got saved, you were given at least one spiritual gift by the whole. It's a birthday gift. The day you got saved, the day you got born again, you were given a gift by the Holy Spirit. Ain't my job to tell you what your gift is. I can't tell you what your gift is. You have to, you have to discover your spiritual gift. And it goes back to verses 1 and 2. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable worship, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can find out what your spiritual gifts are. But when it comes to spiritual gifts and it comes to people working and doing it in the church, people look around and say, well, you know, I wish I could teach like so-and-so. I'd like to be a teacher. Well, if God gave you the gift of teaching, you need to know that. You need to understand. I'm going to brag on somebody here tonight. I'm going to mention Brother Beetle is a gifted teacher. We have other gifted teachers in our church. Brother Beetle, how, how old were you when you started teaching Sunday school? I was a late teenager. He was a late teenager when he started teaching Sunday school. Did you know it was your spiritual gift then? No. But you found out, didn't you? Yes, over the years. Over the years. That's one of the ways you find out what your spiritual gift is. You exercise that gift. You use it, you know. I mean, I've sat, I've sat in classes where... I'm telling you. Well, let's go over our lesson today and they read everything in the quarterly. I can read the quarterly. In fact, I can go to sleep while you're reading the quarterly, you know. But find out what your gift is. Uh, I've had people say, well, I don't know if the Lord's calling me to preach. Try it. Try it. If, if you're not called to preach, if that's not your gift, prophecy, that's what it relates to, you'll find it out. And... Nothing ventured, nothing lost. What have you hurt yourself? What have you hurt anybody by saying, I tried. I tried. So, a realistic, deep look inside ourselves. Not, what was it he said? Not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Honest evaluation. To know ourselves. This goes back to what we just said, to know our strengths, to know our weaknesses, to know our downfalls, our shortcomings. Uh, I mean, I'll talk about my friend. He's an alcoholic. He's been sober for 20 some odd years, but he's still an alcoholic. But I guarantee you won't see him go in a bar and sit down and slap shoulders with all the boys. Why? Because he'd be tempted. You know, he putting himself in a position to do that. So, uh, know your strengths, know your weakness, know what you can do, know what you can't do. And I need to say this, and I won't look at anybody, I'm just going to look up and say it. Don't live in a dream world and think you can do it all. And that's a downfall of a lot of preachers. And I'll tell you a lot of churches create that whole view. Well, 
That's a preacher's job. Well, I've said this before. It's not my job to visit the sick and to visit with us. That's a deacon's job. And our deacons take care of those things. But I do those things because I want to. I do those things because I feel like it's a part of the gift that God's given me in ministry. I don't have to. But I'll tell you this, if you pastor a small country church, you ought to. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just part of what people expect. Why, well, sure. Sure. Well, knowing ourselves, getting to know ourselves, knowing what you can and can't do. Some people don't want to do that and they struggle in that area because they're afraid. It goes back to pride, thinking more how of yourself than you ought. They're afraid to admit that they might have a weakness. And I, I have known people who constantly, and preachers are some of the world's worst, constantly boast about their accomplishments. They want to win approval, draw attention to themselves. And then others go to the extreme and they badmouth themselves. Uh, ought not to think more highly than you ought to think. So an honest evaluation, a realistic approach to this thing. No, I'm not Billy Graham. I will never be Billy Graham. There was only one Dr. Billy Graham. All right? And there may be others who've tried to take his place. I can't imagine, I didn't know about Dr. Adrian Rogers when he went to Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. But the man who had been the pastor there before was a man by the name of Dr. R.G. Lee. Some of y'all may have heard or read or sermons of Dr. R.G. Lee. This guy was a wordsmith. I mean, I've heard some of his old sermons on tape, and he's one of those people that you start listening to him and you just get spellbound listening to what he's saying. Uh, you know, nobody's dozing off, nobody's writing, you know, it just, you're hung on every word. And I can't imagine how Adrian Rogers must have felt. Well, you see how you go take his place. <laughs> Might as well take God's place, you know. And, and, but Adrian Rogers had a deep sense of understanding and appreciation for who he was and look at the ministry Dr. Rogers had throughout the years. Still, his sermons still touching people, his books still touching people. But I don't think he thought more highly of himself than he should. So honest evaluation. What can I do? Well, there's nothing I can do. Well, you're just having a pity party and wanting everybody else to come to it. And you're not serving the right kind of cake and ice cream. It's not good. All right? Uh... Well, I gotta find a place to quit. Uh, I've talked earlier about preachers that have fallen into sin and reproach, and either people are sad about that or they joy in it. But every time that happens, there's a lot of good, well meaning people who get hurt because they worshiped a spiritual leader. And I've said this a hundred times don't worship a preacher. He's a human, and he's going to fall. He's going to make a mistake. He's going to do something wrong. And if you put him on a pedestal and he falls, he's going to fall on you, and both of you are going to be hurt. Anybody got a comment? Yeah, I got to preaching a little, didn't I? It's all right. I like this. Healthy church. Well, I covered one and a half pages in my notes. Really looking forward to talking about the spiritual gift. Thank you all who joined us on Facebook Live. If you can, join us in person. We would like to have you.